Hello and welcome. I'm Shireen Bhan and you're watching Young Turks, India's longest running show on startups and entrepreneurship. It has been a momentous year for General Atlantic, which is celebrating two decades of investing in India. Well, we know what that feels like as Young Turks also completed 20 years of chronicling India's startup story this year. General Atlantic has been a big believer in the digital disruption story since the early 2000s. The growth equity investor has deployed more than $4 billion in Indian enterprises across key sectors like climate, consumer, internet, financial services, healthcare and technology. In the next decade, GA wants to double down on India, which is its top target market. $2 billion have been set aside for investments in Indian and Southeast Asian innovative businesses over the next two years. In fact, its recent $100 million bet on Amagi turned the SaaS media tech startup into a unicorn. This alone can tell us about the size and type of investments that could come in from General Atlantic. Having said that, growth stag Rounds like these have been hard to come by this year. India saw a record $77 billion of private equity and venture capital investments in 2021, but 2022 has been sobering to say the least. Globally, investors have switched to the wait and watch mode, weighed down by tech routes, fewer exits, inflation woes, recession concerns, higher cost of capital and geopolitical uncertainty. Against this backdrop, what's the playbook at GA and what's driving its decision to go big on India as we turn the page to 2020? 23. To answer those questions, joining me on the show, Sandeep Naik, Managing Director and Head of India and Southeast Asia at General Atlantic, and Shantanu Rastogi, Managing Director and Head of India at GA. Gentlemen, thanks very much for joining me here on this very special episode of Young Turks. And let me start by saying congratulations, 20 years, two decades. It's an impressive milestone, Sandeep. Uh, let me ask you for what the biggest hits have been along this journey. Uh, Shireen, uh, thanks for having us and congratulations to you on 20 years of Young Turks. It's been a phenomenal program. It's been one that has truly motivated entrepreneurs in India and a lot of the credit should go to you for really making it happen. So congratulations to you as well. Uh, you know, as we think about the last two decades, we feel very fortunate to have been a part of the story of building some of the most iconic companies in India. You know, it started off with our first deal in 2002 when we invested behind Putney Computers. And that was the beginning of real investments going into IT services in the country, which was followed by Genpact. We then did Jubilant, we did Hexaware, we did uh, IBS, Scient, and we did a bunch of deals which were basically anchored around the theme of outsourcing in India and how you can benefit from the labor arbitrage that India had to provide. So in that first decade of investments, we did a lot of deals focused on BPO and IT, uh, IT outsourcing, while also doing deals in the financial sector, like our bet on NSC, we did uh, Indescent Bank around that time as well. And that was really the flavor of what we did in the first year. So we invested about a billion dollars in 10 deals in the first decade of investing in India. In the second decade, we really expanded our aperture given the domestic con consumption story in India, and the fact that there was a lot happening on the ground in India where we could build companies that could benefit India. And in the second decade, we deployed over $3 billion in companies within financial services sectors like AFL Wealth, Buildesk, KFintech, PNB Housing, recent investment in ACO. In healthcare, if you think about companies like Kim's Hospitals, ASG Eye Care, Rubicon. In consumer, with companies like Anita Dongre, DMART, Capital Foods, as well as Reliance Retail. And then in consumer tech, which is includes Geo, Baiju, Unacademy, as well as No Broker. And so we really expanded the domestic consumption story and back companies where we tripled the investment in the second decade. And that same pace should continue, Shireen, in our third decade, as GA looks at backing great entrepreneurs, building companies for the next India. Well, you know, thanks very much for recapping to us uh, uh, some of the milestones achieved over the last two decades. And it's interesting to see how the, the complexion of the companies invested in has changed between the first decade to the second decade, much more the listed play in the first decade versus the unlisted play or a mix of both in the second decade. So Shantanu, that's what I want to discuss with you. What is decade three hold now as far as GA's appetite to bet on India? And in terms of diversification uh, and in terms of looking at themes that you haven't 
uh, touched on so far. Uh, you know, is there anything on the anvil that's new? Where do you expect to double down further uh, at this point in time? Sure, Shereen. Thanks for having us. And uh, I think decade three is going to be very exciting. India being one of the only major economies in the world, which has the potential to grow at seven to eight percent for the next decade. Um, young population, English speaking, one of the best, uh, one of the countries producing over a, more than a couple of million uh, tech software developers, uh, which are coding for the whole world. Uh, so the outlook is fantastic for India. What we really want to do is um, use our enterprise IT services theme and build on it to back entrepreneurs who are now building software products for the world. Uh, so software out of India is a huge theme for us going forward. Uh, we want to double down on healthcare. Uh, Kim's and recently ASG Eye Care, Rubicon have been fantastic investments for us. And this is a big theme where we believe, you know, shift to private healthcare, affordable healthcare is a, is a multi-decadal theme. And we'll continue to do more in that area. And lastly, I would say the, the underlying theme is really digitization. Mm. With Geo coming in, low-cost data, you know, close to 500 million young Indians having low-cost internet access uh, would create fantastic uh, omni um, as well as direct e-commerce marketplace opportunities that we are very excited about. You know, so uh, uh, healthcare and of course uh, the SaaS story, which we've seen you bet on through companies like uh, Amagi and of course the larger digitization trend that you spoke of, Shantanu. But Sandeep, I want to come back to you now and just to build this out a little bit further. Uh, you know, through the course of the pandemic, uh, the India SaaS story was what everybody was talking about. Companies uh, making in India but for the world seems to have become the theme that investors want to bet big on. What do you see as the key challenges there, especially in the current context where we are seeing uh, both in terms of valuations, but also in terms of market dynamics changing? Do you believe that uh, that story may see some challenges in the near term, while in the long term we agree that it is uh, poised for future growth? And on, on the whole digitization aspect again, you know, but through the pandemic, the bets that were made is that this is the new normal. There's never going to be a revert back to what we saw pre-pandemic. But that assumption hasn't necessarily played through as expected. So on both counts, uh, you know, what are you factoring in? What caveats are you factoring in? You know, I'll split the question, uh, Shireen, because there are two different uh, answers. One is on enterprise SaaS, what's going on, and then on the consumption story, consumer tech in India. On enterprise SaaS, we believe this is a decade-long opportunity, similar to what we saw in the early 2000s when, when we embarked on the IT outsourcing story. You know, Indian IT outsourcing companies created almost a trillion dollars of market cap in the last two decades. We believe that enterprise SaaS coming out of India will create another trillion dollars of market cap in the coming decade. So they will do it within half the time that it took us uh, backing IT services companies in the last two decades. So that's a real trend because 24% of the software engineers globally are sitting in India. India graduates about three to four million engineers every year. And so truly to provide the enterprise SaaS offering to the rest of the world, these companies will have to get created here in India. In terms of the valuation environment, yes, the valuation environment has completely changed and that will also change for the enterprise SaaS companies. And hence, there'll be some great companies that are going after very large addressable markets that will be investable at what seems like very fair valuation. And we are seeing a string of those companies that we are currently in discussions with that we will go ahead and make a play. If inflation continues to be high and if the global economy continues to suffer for the next 18 to 24 months, there will be some slowdown in terms of enterprise SaaS offerings that will get absorbed by these companies. So the sales life cycle might be a little longer and you might see some of the revenues slowing down, but the next decade long story is very much intact. And as GA, you'll see us betting on a lot of enterprise SaaS companies, Indian founders, Indian companies, building out and serving the rest of the world. In terms of the consumption story in India and consumer tech in India, I think we did see an acceleration in terms of adoption during COVID. And once people have now moved out of their houses, you'll see a little bit of that come off. But the awareness and the adoption is real. The stickiness is definitely there. And as a result, this has opened up a whole slew of opportunities, 
whether it be in fintech, whether it be in health tech, whether it be in ed tech, where people have gotten used to using technology to make their products and services that are available to them. And as a result of that, the entrepreneurs that are building companies on top of the India stack that's been created, these will be decacons that will get created in this decade. And as General Atlantic, we hope to be a part of many of those stories. Well, we look forward to many decacons being born uh, here in India, Sandeep. Uh, we look forward to that. But Shantanu, you know, you were talking about the bets that you want to make in the third decade, healthcare, uh, enterprise, SaaS, digitization. Uh, and I want to address the EdTech story because you've been believers in the EdTech story. You've invested in companies like Baiju's, etc. What we're seeing through this phase at this point in time is not just a big correction in terms of valuation, but we're also seeing these companies companies having to pivot their business models. Uh, you know, there are questions on monetization ability and monetization capability and whether uh, this model is eventually going to work in the long term. Uh, has the ed tech space uh, seen a reality check? Is it going through a reality check at this point in time? What do you believe is likely to change within this? Um, that's, a, that's a great point to discuss, uh, Shireen. You know, when a cost of capital increases and liquidity dries up, a lot of sectors have to undergo a reality check. And I think EdTech is no different. When there is a plenty of, plenty of capital uh, available, a lot of business models uh, may have to optimize themselves for a slightly different capital environment. So I believe the real signal remains very strong for the next two decades to create millions of great global workers out of India. And a lot of the companies we have backed thus far and many more that we intend backing in the years to come mm -hmm. would continue to provide great value proposition um, to these uh, learners who want to start you know, coding as well as providing services and building products for the rest of the world. So we remain very, very positive on the long-term outlook for this sector uh, and continue to want to double down in this sector in the years to come. Sandeep, I want to come back and talk about the investment trajectory. You said a billion dollars across 10 deals in the first decade, three billion dollars across a whole bunch of deals in the second decade. What can we expect in the third decade? And I'll ask you this in the context of our last conversation. And you had said that you hope to deploy between a billion to a billion and a half in India. But that hasn't been the case. So you're sitting on plenty of dry powder at this point in time. Yes, you know, last time we spoke was last Jan and I said that uh, we are open for business because that was a time when the global liquidity was really getting pulled back. Great companies uh, that had a real value proposition but didn't have the cash would need to raise capital. That has been delayed by six months, I would say, because some of those companies that had cash didn't need to come to the market right away. But those are all in conversations right now as we speak, uh, because there are some phenomenal companies being built out of India. And these companies will need money. And I think we are always there. We are open for business. We have a lot of uh, dry powder right now. If you look at the trend, Shireen, you know, we invested about a billion in 10 deals in the first decade. Uh, we invested about three times that in 20 incremental deals in the subsequent decade. And I have no question that we will keep that pace. So I would be surprised if we don't put to work at least seven to $8 billion in the coming decade across 20 to 30 companies that will be the most iconic companies that will come out of India. And, and that's really looking back, I think what is success to us is if we can make this entrepreneur successful in helping them achieve their vision of building great companies that serve the needs of India, I think we as General Atlantic would have been very successful in the coming decade as well. Well, so that's almost double of the money that you invested and deployed in the second decade. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the target that you're working with, $78 billion over the next uh, decade across 20 to 30 companies. Well, speaking of uh, companies and investments and news reports, uh, Shantanu, uh, uh, you know, lots of buzz around companies like PhonePay, et cetera. Uh, who, who are you talking to at this point in time? As we, as I told you in the beginning, Shireen, we are very, very focused on the India digital stack. We want to back companies which are enabling millions of Indians access low-cost digital services and in a very affordable manner. And this is a huge theme for us. So we are very keen to keep investing behind this theme. And, uh, you know, for example, the UPI ecosystem, the upcoming Oaken ecosystem, the ONDC ecosystem, these, are, these will be huge areas of focus for us for investments in the years to come. So we want to back uh, the policy agenda, the agenda of the government, and making low-cost 
software, low-cost India stack available to millions of Indians. Okay. Sandeep, you know, while we're talking about India, I also want to talk to you about what's happening in China. And we spoke about this uh, in our last conversation as well. And since then, uh, you know, the regulatory challenges, the regulatory headwinds, China looking much more insular at this point in time. And the expectation or the assumption is that that's good news for countries like India. How are you now seeing this play out uh, with, with the way that China has decided to move as far as uh, tech regulation is concerned and the way that India uh, is moving with its startups. You know, uh, Shireen, you know, if you look back and, and uh, there was a very celebrated report of Goldman Sachs which talked about the BRICS economies and talking about the next 20 to 30 years of growth and the, and the economies that are going to lead it. Uh, if you look at those BRICS economies, you have Brazil, uh, you have Russia, which is almost uninvestable at, the, at, at this point. You have India, which continues to be a shining light. China, just there's a pause in terms of what the policy framework, the regulatory framework there is going to be. And South Africa, uh, well, which again is, is having its own problems. Uh, India is truly the, the, the bright star, right? And as a result, it's not lost on anyone. And as I keep telling people that uh, the India story is very evident, which is why you're seeing so much interest in India today. My fear is that we don't get again uh, flush with so much liquidity that entrepreneurs uh, lose their way because of the over-optimism and over-enthusiasm about India. We have been long, strong-term bulls on India. And in India, the only thing that matters is execution, and execution by putting your head down. And that's what we are really betting on. You know, you gave the BRICS uh, example. And yes, Russia at this point in time is uninvestable on account of uh, the geopolitical situation with the war in Ukraine. But you said it's a pause on China. So uh, it's not as if investors are not willing to place bets on China any further or any longer. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a longer funding winter, perhaps? No, Shireen, no, China is such a large economy, you cannot ignore China. And China will have a very strong domestic economy. The Chinese government is going to focus on making sure that the GDP grows uh, north of 5 to 6 percent. So we continue to be bullish on China. But we just have to wait and see how the regulatory and the policy framework plays out. Uh, but it's not lost in anyone that if you look, look ahead, China will be one of the largest economy. And as global private equity investors, we will have a very strong dominant play in China. So that's that's definitely how GA thinks about our investments in China going forward. You know, Shantanu, speaking about regulatory headwinds, the government uh, in the last budget had announced setting up this committee that would look into any friction and pain points uh, that the PVC uh, community is facing in India. That committee has now been set up. There have been meetings and the expectation is that whatever the recommendations are will perhaps be carried forward uh, in this year's budget, uh, which is around February. Uh, what's the chief issue that requires intervention at this point in time, that requires uh, attention of the government at this point in time. If I were to ask you to list down for us the top three things that you believe the government needs to address, what would those be from a PEVC point of view? Um, you know, I believe, you know, having invested in many regulated businesses and many more that we are looking at, one of the areas that I believe the government is already investing behind and I would encourage them to continue to do uh, further is to have regulators which are uh, continuing to take a lot of suggestions uh, from investors, from entrepreneurs, from companies and have an open sort of listening attitude to making changes, being agile in creating the right framework for companies to grow. I would, I would say that's the number one um, area of focus. The second area that the government has alluded to, uh, which is um, judicial reforms or reforms uh, in being an ability to enforce contracts in a timely manner. Uh, I think what has been great is to see, um, you know, all uh, kind of arbitration awards from Singapore being enforced in a timely way in India. If there is a way in which that process uh, can be accelerated and brought to India, I would say that will be that will give a lot of global investors investing large amounts of capital uh, a lot more confidence. Uh, into uh, investing in India. Uh, the third I would say is just policy continuity um, on a variety of these, um, uh, in the variety of these uh, sectors and um, uh, uh, industries, which, which so far has been the case. And we actually see the implementation of GST, the bankruptcy code, and, and a bunch of other reforms playing out very positively. So we are very encouraged by the, by the way how responsive the government has been 
and has actually heard us as well as many other uh, multinational companies and global investors and in creating the right environment for investment. You know, speaking of uh, the right environment, Sandeep, let me ask you whether we are going to see a long pause as far as exits are concerned. Uh, you know, in in the current uh, in the current climate, what's the expectation on that front? I mean, how how much further do you push out exits at this point? You know, Shirin, if you look at the Indian markets, our stock market is almost at an all-time high, and that's because uh, not only uh, our, is foreign money flowing into the market. India is on everyone's map right now. Everyone wants to increase their allocation to India. And so contrary to what you said, I think exits are very much open in the Indian market. And you've seen us at General, General Atlantic uh, continuously having exits in the market. As you've seen one of our exits in IFL Wealth, which we sold to another competing firm. Uh, we took our company uh, public in, in Kim's uh, and that was a liquidity event for us as well. And there are a couple more that are in the pipeline right now. So the Indian market is very much open for exits, unlike what we are seeing globally, where the market seemed to be a bit shut, either in terms of IPOs or in terms of other secondaries that are happening. So in the Indian market, I see, I, I believe that uh, from a GA standpoint, Indian, uh, the India office is going to be a large contributor to liquidity in the coming 12 months, and the Indian market is very much open for exits. So I don't think we should see a pause or a pushback of exits from the Indian market. You're, you're right in pointing out that the Indian markets have uh, uh, have, uh, have seen a one-way up move even through a very tumultuous global uh, environment at this point in time. But let's talk about uh, the new listing specifically of the new age tech companies that we saw. And there has been significant uh, value as well as wealth erosion. Do you believe that we're perhaps at the bottom of that cycle? Do you think the worst is past? I think that uh, what was happening last year a little bit was just uh, uh, euphoria and momentum investing that was happening, which is why you see you saw us stay out of the market in 2021, uh, which is when a lot of these companies went public or the early part of 2022. I think what you've seen in terms of correction is the, is the right correction. I think companies are valued fairly at this point. So it's tough to say as a market, if you have called the low of the market, I think it's individual company based uh, valuations and i think there are some companies that may still see the downside whereas some company may be trading optimally at this point but as general atlantic you know we are very focused on unit economics we are very focused on profitability we are focused on profitability at scale with decent growth we don't need to see hyper growth in these companies and as long as you sustainably grow profitably i think you're in business for a very long time in india if you have a strong company and a strong founder and those are the companies that we as GA like to back. And hopefully those are the companies that we will bring to the market, into the IPO market in the coming 12 to 18 months. Within your own experience with your current portfolio companies, uh, is there, is there uh, of course, everyone's not talking about cutting down on costs, bringing in more efficiency, doing the right things and not chasing growth, but chasing demand. Uh, you know, are you starting to see uh, visible changes even within your own portfolio companies on being able to get to the path of profitability? And what's the timeline uh, that you're, you're looking? What's the average timeline that you're looking at? Uh, absolutely, Shireen. I think across our portfolio, I mean, the quality of entrepreneurs we have back, we have backed, you know, read um, their opportunities very quickly and move with a lot of agility. We have the highest quality entrepreneurs backing our portfolio companies and running our portfolio companies. Um, they have understood that allocating capital optimally, uh, managing their expenses optimally, reducing areas where long-term potential of the business model uh, may not be uh, may not be viable. Uh, you know, cutting them off from uh, the business model. Are, these are all areas that all entrepreneurs are very focused on right now. Uh, I expect a lot of them to turn profitable in the next year uh, and a lot many more to start generating, uh, you know, free cash flows the year after. The question is, while doing these corrections, I think our guidance is not to overcut and, you know, remove areas which may actually have great long-term potential or lose critical talent in the business. So how do we move towards optimal capital allocation, measured growth, profitable and free cash flow driven growth uh, is the mantra a lot of entrepreneurs have already attuned themselves to and we are very positive about uh, you know, next year, the year after in terms of uh, profitability as well as free cash flows.
Well, Sandeep Shantanu, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much for joining us on this special edition of Young Turks. Here's wishing you and the team at GA the very best of luck. And we do hope that, uh, uh, that this next decade is going to be as exciting as the previous two. Uh, and we look forward to catching up with you again. Thanks very much for your time. Well, that's it then on this edition of Young Turks. For now, from all of us here on the team, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.